Nick Newson, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler. Take two. On this week's episode, we'll cover FAU tailgating drama this weekend, state of the defensive backfield room, a couple commits coming our way in Gainesville for the class of 2022, and the preseason rankings are out. Will had a little bit of uh, technical difficulties last night for our original cord- recording. We normally release this episode on Tuesdays, but uh, yeah, the record button was not pressed last night. Uh, my fault on that one. Yeah, so it turns out that, uh, you know, sometimes delegating is not the best thing, apparently. So <laughs> on the bright side, it's my fault, too, because every time you hit record, the, the little lady on Zoom tells you that you're you're being recorded. So I should I should have seen it, too. But hey, everybody, this episode should be the most seasoned and we should have the best arguments you've ever heard. It should be very cogent and short and right to the point because we just gave them all last night. My wife just laughed her butt off last night because she's like, really, you spent an hour and a half in the basement yelling at each other? other yeah and you didn't actually record it i was like yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah yeah uh, my wife had a good time with that one too she's like oh what are you guys gonna do about that i'm like uh i guess we gotta do it again back to the drawing board but anyway <laughs> it was a preseason episode we're in that time of year it's fall camp it's just fall camp we'll get these kinks worked out before the regular season we promise you guys all right let's jump into two bits uh look hey we're not in 2020 anymore will but we did have a reminder that COVID is still very much going to be a part of the discussion surrounding the 2021 college football season. Obviously, there's been the rise in cases with the Delta variant of late. You had a great interview on the Read and Reaction YouTube channel with Alan Levine. I suggest you, uh, everyone go to uh, the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Check that out. Solid interview there with Will. I'll hit, let him get into the details on that. But this past weekend, r- rumors started swirling on Twitter whether or not tailgating was going to be permitted on campus. Uh, Even Pat Dooley commented on Twitter, but luckily uh, Scott Strickland and the alligator jumped in on Twitter to correct any type of uh, misgivings about what's going on for tailgating for the FAU game says it's going to be open. Scott Strickland says, see you at the swamp and your pregame tailgates on September 4th. So, well, with that being said, just a minor incident on Twitter, no big deal overall in terms of just the overall conversation, but we might still see games canceled at some point this year. The SEC hasn't firmed up that policy. Greg Sankey was talking about they might not decide it even until what like what what it's going to be until the week before the first game. Yeah, you know, last season we spent so much of the offseason talking about whether or not we were going to have a season. We were ready to talk about COVID the whole time. I feel like that hasn't been the focus, but a little bit of a reminder that we're still going to be talking about it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And you kind of have to talk about it, considering that you got the spike that's happening last year. The peak of the spike happened like July 12th. And that's kind of when you had, um, you know, that's kind of when you had the Big Ten and the Pac-12, you know, sort of thinking out and saying and trying to put pressure on people to cancel the season. This year, the peak comes a little bit later, the highest one thus far, almost 26,000 cases in Florida on August 13th, right? Obviously, a whole lot closer to fall camp and a whole lot closer to the season, which makes you think, you know, how are we going to manage this and how are we going to do things and, and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I think they're going to do things incrementally. I suspect that they would, they would, you know, either make vaccination requirements to get into the stadium or mask requirements to get into the stadium before they would eliminate things like tailgating and those sorts of things. I do think they've probably had some high level discussions about how does that stuff elevate? And obviously some of those discussions got out as a decision has been made as opposed to just, Hey, we had some high level discussions about what we were going to do. Um, but obviously good to hear Strickland um, sort of set everything straight and say, this is, this is, this is how we're going to do things. And, you know, I, I do think that you need to be serious about it. Obviously, the Delta variant is is more transmissible, and we're seeing that right now in the numbers. But the death numbers, thankfully, are nowhere near as high as they were last July and nowhere near as high as they were in January. And a lot of that has to do with vaccinations. And so, um, you know, obviously, we don't want anybody to get sick. We don't want anybody to die. We don't want anybody to pass these things on. At the same time, you have to live your life in some capacity. And I think that's part, part of living life is going to college. Part of living life is, is going to the swamp and watching a football game. And, you know, you mentioned the interview that I did with Alan Levine. I mean, one of the things he says, he's going to be in the swamp. He'll be wearing a mask, but he's going to be in the swamp and, and he's hoping that that place is rocking and full. So, you know, somebody who, who manages and oversees a bunch of hospitals and has access to all the experts for this sort of stuff is going to be there. And so I don't see any reason why the university would, would divert from that, um, from that in terms of what they're allowing. And certainly if they're going to put 90,000 people in the swamp, restricting tailgating is probably 
<laughs> it seems like a, a nonsensical thing to do in terms of like packing people together and having people in right. close quarters. You're in much, much closer proximity being in the swamp than you would be out, out by your truck. Yeah. You don't buy tickets for tailgating though, man. Come on. Come on. Uh, the one thing I, uh, I, the one thing that struck me with this too is how it's still an evolving situation, but the sec in general, college football in general last year, there was a lot of contingencies built into the schedule and they've made it pretty clear. Those they're, they're not, you're not going to be seeing us play LSU in December. All that stuff's not going to happen this year. The plan is to stay on track in 2021, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think they'll make exceptions, but it's going to be based on teams that have been vaccinated at rates that they deem acceptable. I think the rates like 85%, something like that. I know they're doing the same thing in the NFL, right? Is that they're trying to incentivize people getting vaccinated by putting a carrot in front of them and saying that if your team gets vaccinated to a certain level, then if there's an outbreak, I mean, I think you're going to have to cancel things. You can't go out and play with a team that doesn't have anybody on it because, you know, a bunch of people are in quarantine because they were exposed to somebody. At the same time, it's not going to be the same quarantine that it was last year. So I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to see teams that are out for two or three weeks in a row. But I, I do think that there might be some maneuvering to add an extra week or something like that if, if the opportunity allows. But no, I mean, it's a full 12 game season, right? They are. Um, they, they don't have extra weeks built in. They haven't started the season later. They haven't restricted it to SEC only. And I think part of that is a recognition that they can do this safely. I think part of it is a recognition that they're going to require a certain level of vaccination on the teams or there are going to be forfeits. But for teams that meet those vaccination requirements, I suspect that there probably will be a little bit of leeway, especially if, if you know, the Delta variant continues to be a problem in the South. But even more than that, the the – if last year is any indication, there's going to be a spike that comes in the Northeast and the Midwest right after this one, as things get cold and people move indoors mm -hmm. and uh, you know, cause that's what we saw last year. And so there are going to be some broader implications to college football. If the Delta variant ends up really causing some peaks someplace else where, you know, some of the concerns that Florida is dealing with right now might be getting dealt with by Ohio state or Penn state or something like that in the coming months. It does make sense for Commissioner Sankey to take a hard line approach in July and August too, as they're trying to drive those vaccination rates up in order to, you know, most safely protect their investments. I guess that's the simplest way you could put that. I mean, there's some of that. I mean, the, obviously the TV contracts and, right. and the money that they make is significant. I think the other thing is, is that, and this was something that came up in the interview with, with, with Alan Levine is that one of the things that I was surprised at when I looked at the data is that people 20 to 30 still spend a pretty like that. It's not like one in a thousand people who end up in the hospital. It's like one in 80 who end up in the hospital who get COVID. Now the number of people who die, who go in the hospital is significantly less, right? So you go in the hospital, you get some treatment. Typically people who are 20 to 30 get out, but it's no joke when you've got a disease that puts you in a hospital and you know, I'm, I'm 39 years old. I had it in March. There were a couple of moments there where I looked at it. I looked, I called my dad and said, you know, I don't know. Should I go into the hospital? It's not a comfortable feeling. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I was about as sick as I've ever been in my life. And so, you know, if you prevent people in that 20 to 30 bracket from getting it and also prevent them from transferring it by getting the vaccine, then great. And, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy around that sort of stuff, but the numbers are pretty clear that there are almost double the number of cases in Florida last year or right now that there were last year in July but the number of deaths is down significantly. And that's because the older population is significantly vaccinated, but it's also because there's a broad swath of people who are vaccinated. So even though the Delta variant is transferring quite a bit, it's less deadly because there are people out there who've protected themselves. And so, you know, I hope people take the opportunity to listen to the, the, the podcast on the YouTube channel to listen to, to Alan and to understand what we're trying to say and then make a decision for yourself. Cause I can't make a decision for you, but I think, I think you're going to learn something new if you listen to that, that exchange. And, and that was sort of the hope with it. And I know there's a lot of exhaustion around the COVID topic and believe me, this is a show about football. We'd much rather <laughs> dive into straight football the whole time, but it's just a part of the outside environment right now that could potentially affect the football season. So just wanted to touch on the topic one time. Plus, Will did that interview with Alan Levine. Be sure to check that out on Re in Reaction our Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Uh, Will and Alan Levine. Let's move on to four bits here. 
junior Jadon Hill, uh, Huntsville, Alabama native who started five games at corner last year for the Gators, suffered a torn ACL, te- uh, torn ACL in his left knee last week. Hill was expected to start in what had hoped to be a bounce back season for this defensive backfield, I guess still hopes to be a bounce back season. Well, uh, despite the setback, though, Florida's 2021 depth chart may be able to handle more of a hit this season than they could in 2020, I think. Uh, you have the additions of Jadarius Perkins from Mizzou, Elijah Blades, not to mention the freshman that everyone had circled anyway on, on, on their watch list, uh, Jason Marshall. Should That should definitely catapult him into some more playing time early. But how do you think this injury affects the rest of the uh, secondary, Will? Well, I mean, I think it obviously impacts your depth. I mean, Hill was the guy who everybody, I think, kind of expected to be the guy who was going to be the starter on the other side. And that means that these guys, these other guys hadn't beaten him out yet. And so, you know, one of the things is that means you're going to take a step back anyway when you put one of these guys in there. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of bodies to choose from and a lot of guys who have a lot of skill. So, you know, guys like Jadarius Perkins and Elijah Blades, you mentioned those guys transfers coming in. They're both six foot two. So they're bigger guys, bigger corners. Same thing with Jason Marshall. He's six foot two as well. Avery Helm, six foot two. And then Ethan Pouncey, I think, is a little bit smaller. Um, but at the same time, these guys all have pretty good recruiting profiles. Blades a couple years ago played significant time at Texas A&M. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think you look at it and say there, are, there's a guy out there with SEC um, experience in, in Blades. There's a guy with college football experience in Perkins, even though it's sort of the junior college type of stuff. You got Helm and Pouncey. You've been in the program for a few years. And then you've got guys like Rashard Torrance and Trevez Johnson to sort of supplement Trey Dean at the safety position and can maybe cover up some of the, the, the warts that you get from the corners if the safeties do a good job of getting over and helping. I think that's maybe the thing that you might see more of is that you're you're going to have to give more safety help, which means you're going to have Kyrie Elam on an island. And I think we've seen that he can hold up, but that's the thing is if something happens to Elam, if he gets nicked or if he has a season that's not as good as he's had the last couple of years, then you could look at it and say, okay, this is a problem because you had to dedicate safety help in that direction. But, you know, out of all the places for Florida to take an injury corner is probably one like running back and corner are probably the two places where they can afford an injury just because of the depth. And like I said, I think the fact that the guys that they have brought in are tall, you know, Marco Wilson was six foot zero. And even though he showed really great leaping ability, um, during the combine, I think we saw when he was up against, um, you know, the Texas A&M wide receiver who was six foot five, who just kind of torched him. You know, we saw that the, the going and getting the ball at the high point when you're playing against a taller receiver is a tough order. And so having some of these taller corners, I think will make a difference, especially on some of the slant routes that were open in the slot where, you know, the corner got there just a little bit too late. The ball's brought in, they get a first down. If you're a couple inches taller, you get your hand in there and you're able to knock it away. So hopefully that's one of the things that they get is bigger guys, more physical guys, and then having guys who can give them better safety help um, along the way. For the amount of criticism Mullen takes on the recruiting trail, I think he's done a great job in the transfer portal of getting guys at positions of need. And thanks to the transfer portal, I I do think that the depth is there this year. The one thing that's – I think this is the the most interesting group on the roster right now. Uh, There's just such a mix of youth and experience here with Elam might be one of your most consistent players that you're really relying on this year. But then you got a guy like Marshall you're hoping can be that next Elam, step right in and take take the torch over. You got guys like Donovan McMillan. You got the the vets like Trey Dean coming back. I mean – Really, the entire secondary will Collier. Is he going to get some playing time at safety this year? Like Trevez Johnson stepping into a bigger role. I, I think this this is there's going to be a lot to see out of this group in, uh, in 2021, and I think it's going to be one of the most improved units on the field for this defense. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, Elam and Marshall are really the – it's the only position group, I believe, where Florida has more than one guy who's a top 50, top 60 recruit. Um and, and, and then the other thing is, is that last year, especially, and we've talked about this a lot, but the defensive tackles didn't, didn't help things, didn't get a lot of pressure up the middle, the defensive ends um, and, and the buck position weren't getting consistent pressure on the quarterback. And so the wide res- or the, the defensive backs were left out there on an Island and they didn't play well, but at the same time, if you're not getting any pressure, then the defensive backs don't really have a chance. And so it all sort of combines where you get, um, you know, where, where if you can get some pressure, it makes the corners and the safeties look better than they are. And then if the corners and the safeties can blanket people, it makes the defensive linemen look better than they are. And last year, we just didn't have any of that, right? No, no, nobody was picking up the other group at all. Um, and, and that's sort of the hope, right? Is that so 
Jadon Hill, yes, someone is going to have to step into that spot, and it's going to have to be somebody like Helm or Pouncey or Perkins or Blades or Marshall. At the same time, somebody else is going to have to step up at the defensive tackle position, at the defensive end position, at the linebacker position to help fill that void and uh, and sort of make it a complete defensive effort. The whole defense, we got, we got, it. we got, we're gonna we're gonna improve that across the board. I I again. It's it's really it really is the the storylines are very similar and we'll get to this when we talk about the preseason rankings here at the end, but this this whole defense there's a lot of excitement around some of these younger guys stepping into roles and really some guys last year who might have been thrown in who were good players but maybe made a few mistakes here or there which which caused some openings at times on the defense. I I, I think this is going to be a more veteran group with with a little more seasoning this year. Will. Well, it, it's weird because as bad as the defense was last year, when you look at this roster, based on experience and the people who came back, the best players are all on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, you look at it, you go Elam, Cox, Carter, Diabate, Ventrell Miller. Like, these are guys that you sit there and say, hey, these are guys who are highly skilled, guys who've shown they can get the job done in the past. And if they can put it together, it can be a really good defense. Um, unfortunately, we have the same defensive coordinator, maybe. And so maybe that's an issue. But the other thing is, is I think you've got more depth in terms of being able to bring people in. That, you know, the, the underestimation of missing spring practice last year, I think, is that for teams that did struggle at certain positions, they didn't have the ability to hold people accountable because you couldn't bring in somebody to replace a guy who screwed up because the guy behind him wasn't ready to play. And for teams like Alabama, that's not necessarily a big deal because the guys aren't screwing up (laughs) who you're putting out there, at least on a consistent basis. But clearly Florida had some of those positions last year where they just both on offense and defense, where they didn't have the replacement to bring in when there were, when there were people who were getting beaten consistently. And when they did bring in replacements, those guys got beat consistently too. There just wasn't a good option. So one of the nice parts about the depth that we've mentioned at the defensive back spot is that if one guy gets put in and he's just not getting the job done, there are other guys who are going to be competing and be able to push people and, and, and really make like, if Marshall gets the starting job, it's going to be because he earned it. It's not going to be because it was given to him because of his pedigree or because there's nobody right. else around. And he happens to be the only guy who can man that spot. He's going to, have to earn it. He's got to, to beat out some guys for that spot. And so I think that's a good thing that there's a significant level of competition and that these guys are going to have to win their spots. Big, big time difference from last year. I, I really, I'm, I'm slowly becoming more and more optimistic about this defense as we head to the season. Maybe it's because I'm delusional, delusional Gator fan, but I'm slowly becoming more optimistic. Am I crazy there? Yes. I think okay. the defense is going to struggle at times, <laughs> um, particularly against good teams. Cause that's kind of been the Grantham MO. Um, but uh, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm hopeful they're going to be, I mean, they're obviously going to be better than last year. I think the question is going to be, can they come through with real big time pressure in particularly up in particular up the middle against teams like Alabama, Georgia, and LSU. And if they can get in the face of Max Johnson, if they can get in the face of JT Daniels, if they can get in the face of Bryce young, then they're going to have a chance to win. Um, but if, if it's like those Jake Fromm games from a couple of years ago, where Fromm just sits back in the pocket for six or seven seconds, I don't care who your defensive back is. They're going to get burned. And so, um, you know, we can talk about Jade on Hill, but I, I really do think, and I've said this all off season, the key to the Florida defense is Kermon Dexter. If Dexter can push up the middle and get in people's faces and win battles up front and free up Cox and, and, uh, and, and Carter from having to deal with double teams all the time then the defense looks completely different. And so that's where I think everything starts is up there at defensive tackle, which is, you know, again, I I feel bad for Hill because he tore an ACL in his other knee when he was in high school. Now he tears the ACL when he was coming in and going to be the starter, going to be a full year before he comes back. And usually the ACL injuries take a couple of years before you get back to the full explosiveness. And so, you know, you, you just hope that he's able to come back full strength. And when he comes back full strength, he's able to also have his full explosiveness so he can really show what he can do. Tough injury, but there is there is the depth there. So I, I'm with you. That That's one of the few positions on the field where you feel like, okay, we do have some other guys that can jump in. But all right, let's move on to six bits here, Will. Three-star linebacker EJ Lightsey commits to Florida on Monday. The Fitzgerald, Georgia native. He, he had his offers. He had offers from Georgia, Florida State, LSU, and Auburn, among others. He's at 6'2", 210 pounds. He's viewed as a versatile prospect by the Gators coaching staff. From Blake Alderman at 24-7 Sports, Coach Robinson sees Lighty thriving in the Gators' defense. He basically said he thinks I could play all of the spots. 
uh, they have because that's what the NFL wants. Someone who is versatile and can do multiple things. Basically, they want to see me. Uh, basically, they want me to drop into coverage and come off the edge. Will the light the light seat commitment brings the class of 2022 to a total of 12, now 13 after today, though, uh, for Dan Mullen and the Gators. And it sounds like he could pair nicely with fellow 2022 classmate Shamar James. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, James is 6'2", 212, and Lightsey is 6'2", 210. So you're bringing in two guys, play linebacker, about the same size. James is ranked 129th overall in 24-7 sports, and Lightsey is ranked 470th. But again, I think one of the things that we're seeing is, you know, we just talked about Jadon Hill going down, right, and needing depth, needing guys to step up, needing to play the percentages that you need people on their – in order to be a championship team, you're going to have to have guys at the three-star level who step up. And, and that's just the way it is. And in fact, when you look at, I mean, look at Alabama last year, Mac Jones is a three-star prospect. And all of a sudden he's in the running for the Heisman trophy because mm-hmm. he's able to really execute a top, top 15 draft pick in the NFL, even though he's a three-star guy. So, you know, when we look at classes in aggregate, I think what we say is that the reason that we harp on five stars or the reason that we harp on top 100 players is that those guys go to the NFL more often than the four stars and the three stars. But at the same time, the difference between a guy ranked 150th and, and a guy ranked 450th is really relatively minimal in terms of how often they contribute and how often they go to the NFL. It's not, it's only a percentage point or two from, you know, where, where, uh, where James is ranked versus where lights he's ranked. And so uh, I think this is a really good depth piece for Florida. And I think the other thing is, is that when you are a three-star guy coming in, and this is something that programs are really going to have to manage now that, now that players are able to transfer without having to sit out a year is that there is strategy to making sure that when you stack players who are similar, that you bring in guys who have expectations of sitting for a year or two before they're going to get an opportunity to start. And you're going to be able to get that kind of, uh, that kind of buy-in from guys who are rated a little bit lower. And, you know, we saw this last year, I think with, with Jalen Kitna coming in where he knows he's behind people on the depth chart coming in. He's a little bit lower ranked guy, but he understands he's going to get great quarterback coaching that he's going to get an opportunity to show what he can do. He'll get an opportunity to win the job, but at the same time, if Anthony Richardson turns into <laughs> turns into Dak Prescott, then then Jalen Kitten is going to graduate and go be a coach somewhere because uh, you know. But I think the the lesson learned from last year's team, and Kyle Trask is a great example of this, right? Last year's team, Kyle Trask stayed around because of where he was in that recruiting. Um, in, in that recruit, like if he had decided to transfer, where was he going to go before he got real reps at Florida? And, and that's, that's, I think, one of the ways that people are going to have to change the way they build some of these recruiting classes. If you're not bringing in a recruiting class like Alabama, where everybody's a five-star and you say, just compete, then, then this might be one of the things you need to do is stack guys who are two, three, 400 spots apart in those rankings and try to sort of stack the top 50 to 100 guys and then have guys in the 400 to 700 range who are behind them. Uh, another three-star prospect out of Deerfield Beach, offensive tackle, David Connor, six foot six, two seventy. Will just committed to Florida uh, today, on Tuesday. Uh, so another nice pickup along the offensive line for the Gators. I watched some of his tape. He plays defensive line and and uh, left tackle. Just looks like a monster in high school film. Obviously, you love that size and that frame. He could definitely fill out into something. I mean, the guy, the guy could be a monster in a couple of years with that size. But local guy, Deerfield Beach in in state here. How you feel about this pickup? I mean, I think it's always a big deal when you get offensive line recruits, particularly with some of the struggles that Florida's had this year, um, bringing in, and really over the last couple of years, bringing in and holding on to offensive line recruits. They've had a couple of guys who've left really before even getting to campus. And, and, and so, you know, I mean, offensive line is one of the hardest places to grade. I think the other thing is, is that it's oftentimes you'll have someone who grades out lower as a tackle who you could move inside to guard. Um, you know, Ethan White was sort of in this same profile, of, of offensive linemen in terms of where he was ranked. And he had one flaw, obviously, and that was how big he was. And, and Nick Savage and, and White, to his credit, has done a great job of getting physically in shape. And now White's going to be a major contributor on the offensive line this year. So I think that's probably what you're looking at here. This isn't somebody who's going to contribute as a true freshman. This is somebody who's going to need to develop, going to need time in the strength and conditioning program, going to need time with the coaches in order to be a successful offensive lineman. At the same time, you can't teach size, right? You can't teach 6'6". 
And, uh, and so from the standpoint of, um, of just from the, the pure, Hey, this guy has size and this guy could be a road grader for an offense that quite honestly is going to need some running help, um, over the next few years with the quarterbacks are going to have in there. I think this is a good pickup. Yeah. Ideal size for a tackle at six foot six there. So good pickup for the Gators at class class 2022, which we talked about a lot on this show is up to 13 commits now. All right, let's move on to a dollar preseason rankings have been released and the near consensus viewpoint is that the Florida Gators are the wild card on the national scene heading into 2021. There's plenty who believe in what Mullins built down here in terms, especially on offense. Emory Jones is getting a lot of positive press in, in the preseason here. The offense, it, it it's believed will still click, but replacing high end talent like Kyle Trask, Kyle Pitts, Kadarius Tony have left some with more questions than answers. Of course, we just had the whole discussion about the defense where we went and you could you could have the discussion about almost any position on the defense that you wanted to. But the Gators check in at number 13 in the AP poll behind Wisconsin and number 11 in the coaches poll behind Cincinnati. Uh, Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated released the top 25 preseason here. He had Florida 18th. He had an interesting quote, Will. He said, this ranking is a direct reflection of faith in Dan Mullen who isn't just a program builder, but a program sustainer. A little, little bit of a backhanded compliment. It says Mullen's a great coach, but uh, then ranks Florida 18th. <laughs> well, that is sort of the dichotomy there, right? I mean, you say, hey, I believe in Dan Mullen. I'm ranking him 18th because I believe in him so much. But that means he's probably losing to Alabama, Georgia, and LSU because a 9-3 and three team in the SEC is probably better than 18th i would think so maybe you're even thinking eight and four and i'd have to go back and look and see how often eight and four teams have wound up have wound up ranked 17th or 18th but that's that's kind of where those teams end up and if you lose to those three i think most people would give you quite a bit of respect over the course of the year but you know that that's a problem because mullen 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 is two and five against those three teams thus far and if he ends up oh and three two and eight going into the next year is uh that's a significant talking point right and he had limited experience against those same teams when he's at mississippi state and so you know it's one of those things where you're going to start questioning you know can he win against those teams that are more talented on a regular basis um and that's something we sort of dismissed when he came to Florida because we assumed he was going to recruit at the level of, of Alabama and, and, and Georgia when he came in, that hasn't been the case yet. And so we'll see, you know, I mean, so pick six previews has him at 19th, Phil Steele has him at 27th. And so from the standpoint Phil Steele of what, does not like our schedule, <laughs> no, he does not. No. So, you know, 40 having him at 18th, the AP and coaches polls, I think are sort of ranking Florida based on the quality of their team, not necessarily what's going to happen with the schedule. Um, but I do find it interesting that basically, um, to me, it sounds, it seems like people are saying Alabama and Georgia are probably pretty much schedule losses. And then the LSU game, because it's in Baton Rouge is going to be a loss. And I, I think that's, I don't think that's given Dan Mullen enough credit. I, and I also don't, I think it's giving Orgeron a little bit more credit considering what LSU did last year and considering what those battles always look like, right. That, that other than the year where Joe Burrow just could not be stopped, this game is almost always a field goal. And to sit there and say, oh, Florida's going to lose that game. I mean, it's possible they lose that game. But I also suspect that Florida's going to be pretty juiced to play LSU next, this year, considering what happened last year. Yeah, absolutely. Going into Baton Rouge, that, that's definitely a game. I know as a fan, that's circled. It's always, it's always a huge game when you go into Baton Rouge, though. That's a great environment, too. But, I, you know, I, I try to keep this perspective. First off, with this schedule in this conference, it doesn't – really matter where you start in the preseason because if you take care of business you'll be at the top anyway and you got Alabama coming to town in week three you, you have your chance to make your statement as to whether or not you're a top five team competing uh, contending for a playoff spot this year pretty quickly but I do try to keep this perspective on the state of the program overall because I think this is a year where after last season the way we finished it was just very like a lot of angst in Gator Nation, a lot of frustration with how they finished that season last year. And it was a great team on offense. The defense, we're not used to seeing it struggle that much. And so I think that was part of the frustration was you felt like you almost kind of blew an opportunity to really bring home a title uh, because one side of the ball just did not, not live up to it. So I, I understand, I understand too, some of the frustrations too. And the LSU loss was just, I, I think that was the one that, cut the deepest i know i i feel like there's a lot of mixed opinions on the cotton bowl loss 
you know, Dan Mullen says the game didn't count. So I have to go with that. I've, I've maintained that one, but not everybody agrees with that opinion, but uh, the LSU game was really the one that, yeah, you didn't even the A&M, when you look back at the A&M loss, eh, that, that one's a little frustrating too. But when Jim McElwain was coaching his final game on the sidelines against Georgia, Florida was down 42 to nothing in the fourth quarter. This is only in 2017. And Dan Mullen comes in, and by 2020, Florida puts up a 41-7 to run against Georgia. In, in, in year three of the Mullen era, I, I felt like when he took that job, I mean, there it felt like there was 100 miles between Florida and Georgia and that it was going to take four to five years to catch what Georgia was building. Not just to become competitive again, but to catch – Georgia has been recruiting with those top of the line recruiting classes. And I know that's something that hasn't quite happened that, that really that elite recruiting class, that top three recruiting class that we all want, but on the field, it's, it, I, I feel like it is getting better despite some of the frustrating moments we've had. And I feel like that Florida is definitely headed in a good direction here. Maybe we are nine and three this year. Maybe we are that eight and four season this year. I don't think that's a, a statement on Dan Mullen not being the guy to lead us somewhere special because I think this program is is headed that direction in the next couple of years at least. Well, well, look, man, we all know you're a homer, so that's the first thing that sort of, <laughs> sort of get out of the way. But then the other thing is, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I, I think that the what Forty is really saying is that Dan Mullen is a really high floor option, right? That the bottom falling out like it did for Wilma Champ in 2013 or like it did for, for Jim McElwain in 2017 is a really unlikely chain of events. There'd have to be a lot of injuries. And even with that, I think Mullen would find a way to get the job done against the lesser teams. The, the concern for Mullen has never been, can he get the team to win a game against Missouri? Can he out scheme South Carolina? It's been, can he get Georgia consistently? He's one and two against Georgia, right? If this year they go in and they go 0 and three against Alabama, LSU, and, and Georgia, he'll be one and three against Georgia and one, of th- one and three against LSU. And to be honest, those are Florida's main rivals. You, you, Urban Meyer put an emphasis on those games. He then went out and beat them, not only on the field, but he beat them in the recruiting game as well. And you can talk all about your evaluations and how your evaluations are different than the recruiting rankings and all that sort of stuff. And that's great if you go out and you win the game. But if you don't win the game, then all then that stuff becomes important. So win the game and you're two and two. And now Kirby's got to start answering questions because right. Kirby is out recruiting you and you're two and two and you have closed the gap. So this year does say something about sort of where the program is because you won last year with a team that was extraordinarily senior loaded, a team that was loaded with guys who were Jim McElwain's recruits and the guys who really turned into the major forces on offense, Kyle Trask and Kadarius Tony were both McIlwain recruits and Kyle Pitts had committed to Florida before McIlwain was let go. And then Mullen was able to keep him in that 18 class. So now if you take your recruits and you're able to beat George, I think that says a lot about you. I mean, this is one of those things where I'm not, I'm not ready to say that Dan Mullen is, isn't the right guy, but I think at the same time, you can't just throw 2021 down the drain and say, well, if you lose to all your main rivals, it's no big deal. It's a big deal. Cause it's a big deal. If you lose to your rivals every year. I'm not saying it's not a big deal to, to lose all your big games. Of course, it's a big deal. But what I'm saying is it's convenient. Like, I mean, we talk about his record against Georgia, for example. Did anyone expect us to win that game in 2018 when he first took over? I mean, even 2019, Georgia was still favored there. I, I, I think it's incredible that they caught they essentially caught the dogs. In, in, and you might even say you still haven't caught them in terms of depth on the roster. You know, that the too deep might be is still, I would think most people would say, well, in Georgia's favor in terms of talent. But there's enough talent on that Florida roster for what Mullen could, you know, big, you know, cook up on the field. I, 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 I think we're, you could easily see it being two and two against Georgia after this year. But it's, it's, I don't know. It's like if he did lose to Georgia this year, Georgia this year obviously we don't want to see that. But Georgia's looking awfully talented. They are the favorites in the preseason to win the East. I, I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, now he's one in three against Georgia because I, I think he took over a program that was miles behind where Georgia was. And I, I think we're right there with them on their heels. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a fair point. At the same time, I think, you know, the old parcel is you are what your record says you are. And, and at the end of the day, if you're, if you're putting the right processes in place. So I'd be far more forgiving of a one in three record against Georgia 
if the talent gap was closing at a faster pace than it's closing right now. Instead, Florida is relying on closing gaps or closing, you know, sort of putting their, putting their thumb in the hole of the dam with the transfer portal in, in all sorts of different cases. And, you know, the, if there are holes in the roster this year that get exploited by the better teams, then you got to look at that and say, okay, why are there holes in the roster? I'm not saying that Dan Mullen – isn't a great coach. In fact, I think he's an awesome on-field coach for the most part. Timeout usage against Alabama last year um, aside. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, one of the things I think is interesting is so Kyle Pitts sits out that LSU game last year, right? And Kyle Pitts, obviously a very special talent. You're not going to be able to replace him. At the same time, they felt comfortable enough to sit Pitts thinking that they could win. And obviously Pitts had some health issues too. And so you don't want to score 34. Still score 34 in that game. Yeah, but how many times did the offense cough the ball up and allow allow LSU to score and all that sort of stuff? And and more than anything, it sets sort of a, an attitude of, of, hey, we think we can win this without our big guy being out there. If Alabama sits, you know, Jalen Waddle last year, somebody else steps in, right? And, and that is the value of those sorts of things is that it's not necessarily the star that you have on the field. It's when the star gets nicked up or when the star has a bad game or when the right. star can't play because he's injured – do you have another guy who can come in and, and give you 90% of what that guy was giving you? And Florida last year didn't have that guy. Kadarius Tony was a monster in that LSU game. And it turned out, though, there were times in the game where LSU was able to take him out of it. And there wasn't anybody else who was really able to step up. And obviously, Fog played a role, too, and all those sorts of things. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm being negative towards Mullen. I don't want to be. I think no, Mullen's you're not. Really- to your, I, I, I'll give you an example. To your point, we, you talked about it earlier with the defense. Dexter, the world, the pressure of the world is on that guy's shoulders this year to come through. We need Gervon Dexter to come through and be an elite defensive tackle. Are the odds good at, with his pedigree and everything? And I, with I, that guy looks like he's a beast, man. I, I think that the odds are good. But if he doesn't work out in an, on the Alabama roster, it doesn't kill Alabama. If he doesn't work out on the Georgia roster, probably doesn't kill Georgia. If he doesn't work out on this roster, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem. Yeah. Well, and, and that's sort of, I think what I'm, what I'm saying when I look at these, when I look at the overall record at two and five and say, Hey, we got to start moving that in the other direction. Um, if he goes two and one right. in those three games, I think we need to laud him, right? Like if you go two and one in those three games, you've done a really, really good job with a team that's in a lot of transition. Yep. If you go one and two, I think you go, okay, that's kind of what I expected. Oh, and three, eh, I'm starting to look at it and be a little bit more skeptical, more so because the the point of the criticism for the recruiting has always been, yeah, you can compete in a given year, but everything has to go right. As opposed to you're going to compete year in and year out and be the big dog in your particular conference and your particular division. And what the thing that was frustrating about the defense last year is that felt like the year where Mullen had put it all together and you got the win against Georgia and then delay an egg against LSU and then go out and, and sort of fall way behind against Alabama, you know, sort of just deflated everything. So the fans are kind of deflated from those last three games anyway, but beyond that, you really had a shot last year because of the elite guys on the offense and just everything couldn't come together because of the struggles on the defensive side of the ball. Are you going to be able to get that to come together this year? That's really the question is, you know, and, and I, I you know, I, I said this earlier on Gators breakdown this week, which is that, um, you know, I have confidence that Mullen's going to score. He had Nick Fitzgerald averaged like six yards a throw in 2017 and still put up 32 points a game. So yeah. in this who, case, who did not look so good when he left, by the way. Yeah. Well, that too. Didn't look nearly as good when, when, uh, when, when the, Penn State but, OC but six down. yards per throw is anemic. Like that, that's, that's like really, really bad. <laughs> the quarterback ran, position ran very well though. He did run very well, but I guess that's sort of my point, right? Is that the offense going to put up the offense last year, put up 38, 39 points per game. The offense this year is probably going to put up 32 or 33, which means to get the exact same record. The defense is going to have to be five or six points better. The good news is the defense was so bad last year that five or six points kind of puts them in like, well, five or six points for the defense kind of puts them at like, middle to lower end of FBS, you know, if, if they get back to where they've been before, you're talking maybe 12. And at that point you end up with a team that's maybe not as good as last year's team, particularly on the offensive side of the ball, but from a record perspective might be better. And again, I, 
like I said, if Mullen goes two and one against the three big dogs next year, uh, I will laud him for doing that. I, I am not expecting three and zero. If he goes one and two, I'll say he did what I expected. If he goes zero and three, I think I think there are legitimate questions that need to be asked because you need I, to be able to beat your rivals. I want to be clear. You obviously it's the Herm Edwards line, right? You play to win the game. Yes, like obviously you want to win the games. It's year four. I, I'll make the comparison. You're in year four with Dan Mullen right now. And you are in the hunt. You you do. We, we're going to go into all those games expecting to be. There's nobody, even Alabama. I'm not expecting anyone to blow our doors off this year. We we should be competitive in every game. But even I think a lot of weight's going to be placed on that Alabama game early, as it should be. It's Alabama, and we want to win the conference, right? However, it's the first SEC game. So even if the Gators walk away with a win in that game, they still got to go to LSU. They got to play Georgia. Those games are almost. Those are just as important and i think that if you put too much weight into like one little part of it it's 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 not really seeing the whole picture and i I think you got to keep perspective this season on where we came from in year one year two where he actually picked up this program and and, and started running with it so i i think it's been great and i i think that even though we got those tough it's a tough schedule this year as usual by the way but even with that situation this year I think you got to give Mullen credit for uh, having the program in a good spot going forward. Hey, I think he deserves all the credit in the world. At the same time, if they end up 18th, I think that's disappointing. (laughs) Back to where we started. All right. Good episode. It did record. I'm looking, I I looked over. I don't know if you caught me throwing my head over there to the side. I was double checking that it was saying record. So just kind of nailed that. Don't mean to brag. Every five seconds, I saw you looking over there, man. So, <laughs> now nah, I, I do want I do want to real quickly say thank you to everybody for getting us up over a thousand subscribers in the YouTube channel. Um, really appreciate that. Appreciate your support for things that we're putting up that aren't necessarily standard Gator stuff. I know you've put up some videos on on Ventrell Miller and George Pickens and Matt Corral recently, and like you mentioned, I put up the the video of the interview with, with Alan Levine about COVID, and you know that's one of the things that I think we're going to do here on this channel is it's. It's going to be Gator centric, but at the same time, we're going to try some things and and do some things that are hopefully unique and different than some of the other people you're following out there. So um, certainly we appreciate all the support. And if you want to support us further, we do do a bonus episode for stand up and holler every week. And so uh, if you go to patreon.com slash read reaction for, uh, for two bucks, you can go ahead and get two bucks a month. You can get access to the, uh, to the bonus episode, just jabbering on again for another 20 or 25 minutes about a specific topic. But, uh, we appreciate all the support, appreciate everybody who's supported the show thus far and really looking forward to, to moving this forward and doing some unique things on the YouTube channel as the season moves along. Hey, like Will said, can't thank everybody enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be back next week on Tuesday. Like we like to release on Tuesday. We'll be back next Tuesday. Until then, go Gators. One week closer, Will. Go Gators, man. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton. Joined by Will Miles, and as always, Go Gators!